Hello everybody, my name is Dr. Talia Markajani. I'm a naturopathic doctor with a special focus in mental health and hormones. And today I'm gonna to do something a little bit different in this video. I'm gonna to read to you guys from an article that I just recently published on my blog called On Emotions and Eating. This is an article outlining some steps to tackle emotional eating. My mother tells a story about my childhood where she's standing in the kitchen preparing dinner. I stand below her, tugging at her shirt, and begging for food. I'm hungry, I say, according to her recollection of the moment and many others like it. She says that as a child, I was always preoccupied with food. My constant yearning for something to munch got to the point where every time she tried to cook dinner, I'd follow her to the kitchen like a hungry dog and persistently beg for food. I was insatiable, she claims. But as an adult looking back, I wonder, insatiable for what? I remember that moment, but from the third person perspective. So I wonder if it's as past events sometimes go or the telling of a memory from an outsider's perspective serves to reshape it in the imagination. I can feel the emotions, however, watching my four-year-old form tugging on my mother's clothing, her body towering over me, her face far away. She stands at the stove. I remember feeling full of what was that yearning? Was it for food? Was it hunger for physical sustenance or nutrition from some other source? I wonder if the constant nagging hunger was an articulation in four-year-old vocabulary of the need for something else. Attention, affection, or reprieve from boredom. I remember being told at one point that my favorite show was on and felt some of the anxiety of missing what I was lacking dissipate. A clue. As a child, adults occupy the gateway to food. As adults, the gateways take on another form. Perhaps it is anxiety about body shape or the guilt of knowing that eating too much of a certain kind of thing isn't nutritious. Perhaps the barrier to sustenance is financial. However, when I stand now in the kitchen, bent over the fridge, arms slung over the open door, contemplating a snack, I know that I'm making a choice. And for myself, as for many others, it's not always clear whether the call to eat is hunger and physiologically based. In the West, we have an abundance problem. More and more adults are reaching obese proportions. Metabolic diseases of excess like diabetes and cardiovascular disease are increasing and more and more women are experiencing the hormonal dysregulation that can come from carrying an excess of body fat. While I don't recommend aspiring to the emaciated standard that we see plastered on magazines, Pinterest ads, or runways, I do think that for many people, balancing energy intake with energy output could be beneficial for optimal health and hormonal signaling. Body fat is me metabolically active. It also stores toxins and alters the way our body metabolizes in response to hormones. Insulin being just one example and estrogen being another. Therefore, conditions like PCOS, infertility, diabetes, PMS, and dysmenorrhea or certain inflammatory conditions might benefit from a certain amount of weight loss. And this is an addition here. This post is not about body shame or even necessarily about weight loss per se. It's about overcoming emotional eating patterns that might even derive from the same disordered patterns that manifest in anorexia or bulimia. The goal of this post is to bring more awareness to how we operate within the complex relationships many of us have with our food and with our bodies. There are many reasons why we eat and physiological hunger is only one of them. Tangled up in the cognitive understanding of hunger is a desire for pleasure, a desire to experiment, to taste, to experience a food, to nourish oneself as a reward, to combat boredom, and to smother one's emotions like anxiety, depression, ennui, yearning for something else. We often eat to avoid feeling. Health issues aside, I believe that emotional eating, as it's so-called, is problematic because it dampens our experience of living. By stuffing down our emotions, by stuffing our faces, we prevent ourselves from feeling emotions that might be beneficial for us to feel in order to move through life in ways that are more self-aware, mature, self-developed and meaningful. While some emotional reasons to eat might be legitimate, such as acknowledging your beloved grandmother's hard work by having a few bites of handmade gnocchi, <laughs> a personal example, 
Uh, many of the reasons we eat linger below the surface of our conscious mind, resulting in us suffering from the consequence of, of psychological mechanisms that we're unaware of. I believe in making choices from a place of conscious awareness rather than a place of subconscious suffering. In heading directly into the reasons I'm tempted to emotionally overeat, I've learned quite a lot about myself. I've ended up eating less as I've become more aware of the non-hunger non related reasons that I reach for a snack, but that doesn't have to be the end goal for everyone. I believe that just understanding ourselves through uncovering and analyzing the emotions that influence everyday behaviors can have life-changing effects. It allows us to know ourselves better. As I work through the process of understanding why I overeat, I realize there are a few steps to address. I believe that there are layers to the reasons we enact unconscious behaviors. And first, it is important to untangle the physiological from the emotional reasons for eating, understanding what real hunger feels like, and address the logical reasons for overeating. And then, when ready, head straight into the emotions that might cause overeating to occur. Step one is distinguishing between physiological hunger and emotional hunger. The first step, of course, is to distinguish between physiological or physical hunger, the body's cry for food, calories and nourishment, and emotional hunger. Typically, psych physiological hunger comes on slowly. It starts with a slow burn of the stomach, growling, a feeling of slight gnawing. It grows as the hours pass. For some, it might feel like a drop in blood sugar. More on this later such as feeling low energy, dizzy, and perhaps irritable. Physiological hunger occurs hours after the last meal, provided the last meal was sufficient. Usually if one drinks water at this time, the physiological hunger subsides and then returns. Essentially, eating a meal or snack will result in the hunger vanishing and returning again still hours later. Emotional hunger, however, is different. It starts with an upper body desire to eat. It may be triggered by a commercial, social situations, or certain strong emotions. There might be cognitive reasons to eat, such as I'm, I might be hungry later, or we're passing by that taco place I like, <laughs> that are not directly guided by the physical desire for sustenance. Emotional eating is often felt in the mouth rather than the stomach. It might be brought on by the desire to taste or experience the food rather than to fill oneself. The cravings might be specific or or for a certain food source, such as cookies. This is not a hard and fast rule, however. Emotional hunger does not vanish from drinking water. Emotional hunger comes on suddenly and is often not relieved by eating the prescribed amount of food, such as having a full meal. And oftentimes we finish lunch only to find ourselves unable to get the cookies at the downstairs coffee shop out of our heads. Number two is, Settling hormonal reasons for overeating, looking at serotonin, insulin, and cortisol. Not all physiological hunger, however, is experienced as a slow, gnawing, slightly burning, grumbling stomach sensation described above. Sometimes we experience the need to eat because our blood sugar has crashed or our neurological needs for serotonin have gone up. We might eat because stress hormones have caused blood sugar to spike and then crash. We might also experience certain cravings for food because our physiological needs for macronutrients like carbs, fat, or protein, or micronutrients like sodium or magnesium have not been met. Therefore, it becomes essential to address the hormonal imbalances and nutritional deficiencies that might be causing us to overeat. Oftentimes, getting off the blood sugar roller coaster is the first step. This often involves a combination of substituting sugar and refined flours for whole grains, increasing fats and proteins, and of course, avoiding eating carbohydrate or sugar-rich foods on their own, which can spike blood sugar. It also involves having a protein-rich breakfast. I tend to address this step first whenever my patients come in and express feeling hangry, irritable and angry between meals. Often drops in brain levels of serotonin cause us to crave carbohydrate-rich foods. This is very common for women experiencing PMS. In this case, balancing hormones and perhaps supplementing with amino acids like L-glutamine, tryptophan, and 5-HTP can go a long way. One of the questions I ask my patients who crave a snack at around 2 to 3 p.m., a mere two to three hours after their lunchtime meal, assuming their lunch contained adequate nutrients, is... Do you crave sugar, caffeine, salt, or a combination of the above? 
Cravings for sugar or salt at this time might indicate a drop in cortisol and give us a clue, combined with the presence of other symptoms, that this person is in a state of chronic stress, burnout, or adrenal fatigue. In this case, it's essential to support the adrenal glands with herbs or nutrients, rest, and consuming adequate protein during the afternoon crash. Finally, when it comes to cravings for food like chocolate, meat or nuts, or even specific vegetables. So when living in South America, I would experience overwhelming cravings for broccoli, funnily enough. I find it important to identify any nutrient deficiencies. It is common to experience a deficiency in something like magnesium, iron, selenium, zinc, and the fat-soluble vitamins A, D, E, and K, and our bodies will do their best to beg us for the specific foods they've come to learn contain these nutrients. Either consciously eating more of these foods, like Brazil nuts, in order to obtain more selenium, preferably in their healthiest form, such as dark chocolate, as opposed to milk chocolate, to obtain more magnesium, or directly supplementing in the case of severe deficiency, often results in the cravings diminishing. Three is the hunger scale in food diaries. One of the first things I have patients do is understand the hunger scale. There are a variety of these scales on the internet that help us cognitively understand the stages the body goes through on its quest to ask for food and its attempt to communicate fullness. Being able to point to certain levels of hunger and fullness and pinpoint those physiological feelings on the hunger scale allows us to further flush out the subtleties between a physical or emotional desire for food. Food diaries, I find, can help bring more awareness to one's daily habits. And oftentimes keeping a food diary for a few weeks is enough for some patients to drop their unwanted eating behaviors altogether. Other times it can help us detect food sensitivities and unhealthier eating patterns or food choices. It also helps me as a practitioner work off a map that illustrates a patient's diet and lifestyle routines in order to avoid imposing my own ideas in ways that might not be sustainable or workable for that particular individual. A word about diet diaries, however, when recording food for the purpose of uncovering emotional eating patterns, I often stress that it's important to record every single food. Sometimes people will avoid writing in their diary after a binge or outlining each food when they feel they've lost control, writing instead junk food. <laughs> Guilt can keep us from fully confronting certain behaviors we'd rather not have acted out. However, I want to emphasize that the diary is not a confession. It's not, nor should it be, an account of perfect eating or evidence that we've healed. Keeping a diet diary is simply a tool to slow down our actions and examine them. It's a means of finding out how things are, not immediately changing them into what we'd like them to be. This is an important reminder. The best place to start any investigation into being is from a place of curiosity. Remember that the point of this exercise is to observe and record. Not necessarily to change, not yet. It's very difficult, or even, I would argue, impossible to completely eradicate a behavior if the reasons for engaging in that behavior escape our conscious awareness. Therefore, recording food allows us to begin to poke at the fortress that contains the subconscious mind. We start to slow down and uncouple the thoughts and emotions from the actions that they precede, and in doing so, develop some insights into how we work it can help to start jotting down other relevant points that might intersect with what was eaten. These pieces of information might include time of day, where you were, what thoughts were popping into your head, and how you felt before and after eating the food. As we observe, more information begins to enter our conscious experience, allowing us to better understand ourselves. Number four, peeling back the layers, understanding the practical and logical reasons for overeating. One of the things that I've noticed through my own work with addressing emotional eating is that there are often layers to the reasons one might overeat. Some of the first layers I encountered were cognitive or seemingly logical reasons. For example, I noticed that before eating without hunger, I might justify it by thinking, I need to finish the rest of these, I don't want them to go to waste, or I'll finish these in order to clean out the container, or I should eat something now so I won't be hungry later or I didn't eat enough insert type of food here today, so I'll just eat something now for my health. Or if I don't have some blank at so-and-so's house, she'll be offended. 
When looking more closely into these justifications, I found them to be flawed. However, they were logical enough for me to eat for reasons other than to satisfy a legitimate physiological yearning for nutrients. It's interesting to see how the mind often tries to trick us into certain behaviors and how we comply with its logic without argument. Step five, addressing the practical reasons, planning. In order to address the first layer of rationale for eating when not hungry, I decided to do the following. I'd plan my next meal and either have it ready in the fridge or pack it with me to go. And then I'd wait all day until I was hungry enough to eat it. I'd repeatedly ask myself every time I thought of reaching for my portions, am I hungry now? And would answer that question with, is there rumbling in my stomach? No, then it's not time to eat. I found it would often be several hours later before my body would genuinely ask for the food. I also found that eating satisfied the physical hunger often much sooner than it took me to finish the food. I realized how I often eat much more food and much more often than I genuinely need. However, holding off eating until physical hunger arises takes a conscious effort that is often unsustainable. Few of us can move through our busy lives constantly asking ourselves how hungry we are and when, and then have food at the ready to satisfy that hunger with appropriate healthy choices. Therefore, I use this practice as a mere stepping stone to move through the deeper layers of emotional eating. By addressing the rational and logical reasons for overeating, I was able to get in touch with the deeper emotional and arguably real reasons for which I was eating without hunger. Step six, peeling back the layers, understanding the deeper emotional reasons for overeating. For a while I'd wake up, make myself a coffee, and then wait until I felt hungry. Sometimes the feeling would arise in a few minutes, sometimes it would take hours. Depending on what I'd eaten the previous day and what my activity levels were, I'd often not get hungry until well into the afternoon. However, the thoughts of eating something would frequently persist. And when the thoughts came up, whereas before they'd be satisfied by me having something to eat, I now resisted them. When I resisted the thoughts, their associated emotions would strengthen. I then decided to journal before reaching for food, especially when I wasn't sure if I was actually hungry or not. Journaling can help us pull up, process, and make sense of some of our emotions. I'd write about what I might be feeling, what I might be asking for that wasn't food. Through doing this, emotional reasons for hunger began to surface. The more I held off eating, the stronger and more clear the emotions were. It was a deeply uncomfortable process. This is why we emotionally eat. Removing the emotions is often far more pleasant than dealing with them. Emotions that surface were anxiety, ennui, boredom, loneliness, and sometimes even anger. However, boredom and a listless, almost nihilistic sense of ennui were among the two most common emotions I realized that eating medicated for me. For me, eating was entertainment. It broke up the monotony of the day and gave my senses something to experience. It gave my body something to do, chewing, tasting, and digestion. Not eating made that sense of boredom grow stronger. Step seven, addressing the emotional reasons by nurturing and preventing. Knowing more about the root emotional causes for overeating allowed me to work more closely with the source of my behavior. I found that the closer we get to the source, to the roots, the more effective we are at removing the weeds or behaviors from our lives. I knew now that if I didn't want to overeat, I'd have to prevent myself from getting bored. I'd have to have checklists of things to do. I'd have to stay active and engaged in life, in my work, my friendships, and other non-food related things that brought meaning to my life. During this time, I did more yoga and meditated, I journaled and wrote. I also meditated on boredom. I traced it back to where I might have felt it in my life before, and noticed themes of boredom in my childhood. I realized that the child tugging on her mother's shirt and asking when dinner was ready was probably a child who needed something to do, a child who was bored. Step eight, peeling back the layers, working directly with core emotions. Going even further, we can begin to peel back the layers of emotional reasons for overeating in order to avoid replacing one addiction with another, such as replacing overeating with overbusying oneself, distraction, or overworking. I began to find other emotions that ran deeper than mere boredom. I also realized that whenever I had felt boredom in the past, there was a threshold often filled with discomfort that I would eventually surpass. Once surpassing this threshold, a well of creativity or a plethora of interesting insights would spring forth. 
I remember as a child I'd create stories or lie on my bed and stare at the ceiling of my bedroom contemplating the nature of the universe. <laughs> These beautiful moments have been made possible by boredom and my courage to not distract myself from it. Working with a therapist or doing some deep inner work we can access the core beliefs and emotions that might cause these emotional reasons for overeating to exist. Oftentimes we encounter core beliefs whose effects spill out into other areas of our lives, preventing us from living fully and consciously. Working through these beliefs can be deeply satisfying and help us experience transformational self-growth. The final step is step nine, setbacks and understanding change theory. Finally, engaging in this process of self-discovery doesn't follow the same pattern in every person. Some people may find that their reasons for overeating are dissolved as soon as they start recording the foods they eat. And this is surprisingly common. Others might find that years of working with a therapist have resulted in a mere dent in their ability to eat in response to hunger and to stop unwanted eating behaviors. In most everyone, progress is not linear. Change theory in the stages of change schema depicts the alteration of behaviors as cyclical rather than linear. As we move through the stages, we enter a cycle of pre-contemplation, contemplation planning, action, and maintenance. Sometimes we fall out of the cycles and relapse. However, many people working with behavioral changes and addictions prefer to rename relapse prolapse, claiming that prolapse is a necessary stage for continuing the cycle of change and that much is to be learned from failing at something. It is through observing how the world produces unexpected results and then attempting to understand the unexpected while trying again, where learning takes place. We don't really learn if we don't fail. Sometimes addictive behaviors, emotional eating included, worsen at a time when someone is on the verge of making a massive breakthrough. Sometimes poking in a new layer of the source of unwanted behavior accompanies an exacerbation in the practice of that behavior. Having curiosity and self-compassion throughout the process is essential. Savoring the increased self-awareness that comes with any effort to affect change in one's life is part of the enjoyment of the experience. My name is Dr. Talia Marcajani. I'm a naturopathic doctor and I practice in Toronto. You can contact me at connect at taliaND.com or visit my website for more articles and videos at taliaND.com.